the way to the realization of a universal religion delivered in the Universalist Church, Pasadena, California, 28th January, 1900. No search has been dearer to the human heart than that which brings to us light from God. No study has taken so much of human energy, whether in times past or present, as the study of the soul, of God, and of human destiny. However immersed we are in our daily occupations, in our ambitions, in our work, in the midst of the greatest of our struggles, sometimes there will come a pause. The mind stops and wants to know something beyond this world. Sometimes it catches glimpses of a realm beyond the senses, and a struggle to get at it is the result. Thus it has been throughout the ages, in all countries. Man has wanted to look beyond, wanted to expand himself, and all that we call progress, evolution, has been always measured by that one search, the search for human destiny, the search for God. As our social struggles are represented amongst different nations by different social organizations, so is man's spiritual struggle represented by various religions. And as different social organizations are constantly quarreling, are constantly at war with one another, so these spiritual organizations have been constantly at war with one another, constantly quarreling. Men belonging to a particular social organization claim that the right to live only belongs to them, and so long as they can, they want to exercise that right at the cost of the weak. We know that just now there is a fierce struggle of that sort going on in South Africa. Similarly, each religious sect has claimed the exclusive right to live. And thus we find that though there is nothing that has brought to man more blessings than religion, yet, at the same time, there is nothing that has brought more horror than religion. Nothing has made more for peace and love than religion. Nothing has engendered fiercer hatred than religion. Nothing has made the brotherhood of man more tangible than religion. Nothing has bred more bitter enmity between man and man than religion. Nothing has built more charitable institutions, more hospitals for men and even for animals than religion. Nothing has deluged the world with more blood than religion. We know at the same time that there has always been an undercurrent of thought. There have been always parties of men, philosophers, students of comparative religion who have tried and are still trying to bring about harmony in the midst of all these jarring and discordant sects. As regards certain countries, these attempts have succeeded, but as regards the whole world, they have failed. There are some religions which have come down to us from the remotest antiquity, which are imbued with the idea that all sects should be allowed to live, that every sect has a meaning, a great idea, embedded within itself, and therefore it is necessary for the good of the world and ought to be helped. In modern times, the same idea is prevailing and attempts are made from time to time to reduce it to practice. These attempts do not always come up to our expectations, up to the required efficiency. Nay, to our great disappointment, we sometimes find that we are quarrelling all the more. Now leaving aside dogmatic study and taking a common sense view of the thing, we find at the start that there is a tremendous life power in all the great religions of the world. Some may say that they are ignorant of this, but ignorance is no excuse. If a man says, I do not know what is going on in the external world, therefore, things that are going on in the external world do not exist, that man is inexcusable. Now those of you that watch the movement of religious thought all over the world are perfectly aware that not one of the great religions of the world has died. Not only so, each one of them is progressive. Christians are multiplying, Mohammedans are multiplying, the Hindus are gaining ground, and the Jews also are increasing. And by their spreading all over the world and increasing rapidly, the fold of Judaism is constantly expanding. Only one religion of the world, an ancient, great religion, has dwindled away. And that is the religion of Zoroastrianism, the religion of the ancient Persians. Under the Mohammedan conquest of Persia, about a hundred thousand of these people came and took shelter in India, and some remained in ancient Persia. Those that were in Persia, under the constant persecution of the Mohammedans, dwindled down till there are at most only 10,000. In India, there are about 80,000 of them, but they do not increase. Of course, there is an initial difficulty. They do not convert others to their religion. And then, this handful of persons living in India, with the pernicious custom of cousin marriage, 
do not multiply. With this single exception, all the great religions are living, spreading and increasing. We must remember that all the great religions of the world are very ancient. Not one has been formed at the present time and that every religion of the world owes its origin to the country between the Ganga and the Euphrates. Not one great religion has arisen in Europe, not one in America, not one. Every religion is of Asiatic origin and belongs to that part of the world. If what the modern scientists say is true, that the survival of the fittest is the test, these religions prove by their still living that they are yet fit for some people. There is a reason why they should live. They bring good to many. Look at the Mohammedans, how they are spreading in some places in southern Asia and spreading like fire in Africa. The Buddhists are spreading all over Central Asia all the time. The Hindus, like the Jews, do not convert others. Still gradually, other races are coming within Hinduism and adopting the manners and customs of the Hindus and falling into line with them. Christianity, you all know, is spreading though I am not sure that the results are equal to the energy put forth. The Christian's attempt at propaganda has one tremendous defect, and that is the defect of all Western institutions. The machine consumes 90% of the energy. There is too much machinery. Preaching has always been the business of the Asiatics. The Western people are grand in organization, social institutions, armies, governments, etc. But when it comes to preaching religion, they cannot come near the Asiatic whose business it has been all the time, and he knows it, and he does not use too much machinery. This, then, is a fact in the present history of the human race, that all these great religions exist and are spreading and multiplying. Now there is a meaning, certainly, to this, and had it been the will of an all-wise and all-merciful creator that one of these religions should exist and the rest should die, it would have become a fact long, long ago. If it were a fact that only one of these religions is true and all the rest are false, by this time it would have covered the whole ground. But this is not so. Not one has gained all the ground. All religions sometimes advance, sometimes decline. Now just think of this. In your own country, there are more than 60 millions of people and only 21 millions professing religions of all sorts. So it is not always progress. In every country, probably, if the statistics are taken, you would find that religions are sometimes progressing and sometimes going back. Sects are multiplying all the time. If the claims of a religion that it has all the truth and God has given it all this truth in a certain book were true, why are there so many sects? Fifty years do not pass before there are twenty sects founded upon the same book. If God has put all the truth in certain books, he does not give us those books in order that we may quarrel over texts. That seems to be the fact. Why is it? Even if a book were given by God which contained all the truth about religion, it would not serve the purpose because nobody could understand the book. Take the Bible, for instance, and all the sects that exist amongst Christians. Each one puts its own interpretation upon the same text, and each says that it alone understands that text, and all the rest are wrong. So with every religion. There are many sects among the Mohammedans and among the Buddhists and hundreds among the Hindus. Now I bring these facts before you in order to show you that any attempt to bring all humanity to one method of thinking in spiritual things has been a failure and always will be a failure. Every man that starts a theory, even at the present day, finds that if he goes 20 miles away from his followers, they will make 20 sects. You see that happening all the time. You cannot make all conform to the same ideas. That is a fact. And I thank God that it is so. I am not against any sect. I am glad that sects exist. And I only wish they may go on multiplying more and more. Why? Simply because of this. If you and I and all who are present here were to think exactly the same thoughts, there would be no thoughts for us to think. We know that two or more forces must come into collision in order to produce motion. It is the clash of thought, the differentiation of thought, that awakes thought. Now, if we all thought alike, we would be like Egyptian mummies in a museum looking vacantly at one another's faces. No more than that. Worlds and eddies occur only in a rushing, living stream. There are no whirlpools in stagnant, dead water. When religions are dead, there will be no more sects. It will be the perfect peace and harmony of the grave. But so long as mankind thinks, 
there will be sects. Variation is the sign of life and it must be there. I pray that they may multiply so that at last there will be as many sects as human beings and each one will have his own method, his individual method of thought in religion. But this thing exists already. Each one of us is thinking in his own way, but his natural course has been obstructed all the time and is still being obstructed. If the sword is not used directly, other means will be used. Just hear what one of the best preachers in New York says. He preaches that the Filipinos should be conquered because that is the only way to teach Christianity to them. They are already Catholics, but he wants to make them Presbyterians and for this he is ready to lay all this terrible sin of bloodshed upon his race. How terrible! And this man is one of the greatest preachers of this country, one of the best informed men. Think of the state of the world when a man like that is not ashamed to stand up and utter such arrant nonsense. And think of the state of the world when an audience cheers him. Is this civilization? It is the old bloodthirstiness of the tiger, the cannibal, the savage, coming out once more under new names, new circumstances. What else can it be? If the state of things is such now, think of the horrors through which the world passed in olden times, when every sect was trying by every means in its power to tear to pieces the other sects. History shows that. The tiger in us is only asleep, it is not dead. When opportunities come, it jumps up and as of old, uses its claws and fangs. Apart from the sword, apart from material weapons, there are weapons still more terrible, contempt, social hatred and social ostracism. Now these are the most terrible of all inflictions that are hurled against persons who do not think exactly in the same way as we do. And why should everybody think just as we do? I do not see any reason. If I am a rational man, I should be glad they do not think just as I do. I do not want to live in a grave-like land. I want to be a man in a world of men. Thinking beings must differ. Difference is the first sign of thought. If I am a thoughtful man, certainly I ought to like to live amongst thoughtful persons where there are differences of opinion. Then arises the question, how can all these varieties be true? If one thing is true, its negation is false. How can contradictory opinions be true at the same time? This is the question which I intend to answer. But I will first ask you, are all the religions of the world really contradictory? I do not mean the external forms in which great thoughts are clad. I do not mean the different buildings, languages, rituals, books, etc. employed in various religions, but I mean the internal soul of every religion. Every religion has a soul behind it and that soul may differ from the soul of another religion. But are they contradictory? Do they contradict or supplement each other? That is the question. I took up the question when I was quite a boy and have been studying it all my life. Thinking that my conclusion may be of some help to you, I place it before you. I believe that they are not contradictory, they are supplementary. Each religion, as it were, takes up one part of the great universal truth and spends its whole force in embodying and typifying that part of the great truth. It is therefore addition, not exclusion. That is the idea. System after system arises, each one embodying a great idea, and ideals must be added to ideals. And this is the march of humanity. Man never progresses from error to truth, but from truth to truth, from lesser truth to higher truth. But it is never from error to truth. The child may develop more than the father, but was the father inane? The child is the father plus something else. If your present state of knowledge is much greater than it was when you were a child, would you look down upon that stage now? Will you look back and call it inanity? Why, your present stage is the knowledge of the child plus something more. Then again, we also know that there may be almost contradictory points of view of the same thing, but they will all indicate the same thing. Suppose a man is journeying towards the sun, and as he advances, he takes a photograph of the sun at every stage. When he comes back, he has many photographs of the sun, which he places before us. We see that not two are alike, and yet, who will deny that all these are photographs of the same sun, from different standpoints? Take four photographs of this church from different corners, how different they would look, and yet, they would all represent this church, in the same way. We are all looking at truth from different standpoints. 
which vary according to our birth, education, surroundings, and so on. We are viewing truth, getting as much of it as these circumstances will permit, coloring the truth with our own heart, understanding it with our own intellect, and grasping it with our own mind. We can only know as much of truth as is related to us, as much of it as we are able to receive. This makes the difference between man and man, and occasions sometimes even contradictory ideas, yet we all belong to the same great universal truth. My idea, therefore, is that all these religions are different forces in the economy of God, working for the good of mankind, and that not one can become dead, not one can be killed. Just as you cannot kill any force in nature, so you cannot kill any one of these spiritual forces. You have seen that each religion is living. From time to time, it may retrograde or go forward. At one time, it may be shorn of a good many of its trappings. At another time, it may be covered with all sorts of trappings. But all the same, the soul is ever there. It can never be lost. The ideal which every religion represents is never lost. And so every religion is intelligently on the march. And that universal religion about which philosophers and others have dreamed in every country already exists. It is here. As the universal brotherhood of man is already existing, so also is universal religion. Which of you that have travelled far and wide have not found brothers and sisters in every nation? I have found them all over the world. Brotherhood already exists. Only there are numbers of persons who fail to see this and only upset it by crying for new brotherhoods. Universal religion too is already existing. If the priests and other people that have taken upon themselves the task of preaching different religions simply cease preaching for a few moments, we shall see it is there. They are disturbing it all the time because it is to their interest. You see that priests in every country are very conservative. Why is it so? There are very few priests who lead the people. Most of them are led by the people and are their slaves and servants. If you say it is dry, they say it is so. If you say it is black, they say it is black. If the people advance, the priests must advance. They cannot lag behind. So before blaming the priests, it is the fashion to blame the priest. You ought to blame yourselves. You only get what you deserve. What would be the fate of a priest who wants to give you new and advanced ideas and lead you forward? His children would probably starve and he would be clad in rags. He is governed by the same worldly laws as you are. If you go on, he says, let us march. Of course, there are exceptional souls, not cowed down by public opinion. They see the truth and truth alone they value. Truth has got hold of them, has got possession of them as it were, and they cannot but march ahead. They never look backward, and for them there are no people. God alone exists for them. He is the light before them, and they are following that light. I met a Mormon gentleman in this country, who tried to persuade me to his faith. I said, I have great respect for your opinions, but in certain points we do not agree. I belong to a monastic order, and you believe in marrying many wives. But why don't you go to India to preach? Then he was astonished. He said, Why, you don't believe in any marriage at all, and we believe in polygamy, and yet you ask me to go to your country? I said, Yes, my countrymen will hear every religious thought wherever it may come from. I wish you would go to India first, because I am a great believer in sects. Secondly, there are many men in India who are not at all satisfied with any of the existing sects, and on account of this dissatisfaction, they will not have anything to do with religion, and possibly you might get some of them. The greater the number of sects, the more chance of people getting religion. In the hotel, where there are all sorts of food, everyone has a chance to get his appetite satisfied. So I want sects to multiply in every country, that more people may have a chance to be spiritual. Do not think that people do not like religion. I do not believe that. The preachers cannot give them what they need. The same man that may have been branded as an atheist, as a materialist, or what not, may meet a man who gives him the truth needed by him, and he may turn out the most spiritual man in the community. We can eat only in our own way. For instance, we Hindus eat with our fingers. Our fingers are suppler than yours. You cannot use your fingers the same way. Not only the food should be supplied, but it should be taken in your own particular way. Not only must you have the spiritual ideas, 
but they must come to you according to your own method. They must speak your own language, the language of your soul, and then alone they will satisfy you. When the man comes who speaks my language and gives truth in my language, I at once understand it and receive it forever. This is a great fact. Now from this we see that there are various grades and types of human minds and what a task religions take upon them. A man brings forth two or three doctrines and claims that his religion ought to satisfy all humanity. He goes out into the world, God's menagerie, with a little cage in hand and says, God and the elephant and everybody has to go into this. Even if we have to cut the elephant into pieces, he must go in. Again, there may be a sect with a few good ideas. Its followers say, all men must come in. But there is no room for them. Never mind. Cut them to pieces. Get them in anyhow. If they don't get in, why, they will be damned. No preacher, no sect have I ever met that pauses and asks, why is it that people do not listen to us? Instead, they curse the people and say, the people are wicked. They never ask, how is it that people do not listen to my words? Why cannot I make them see the truth? Why cannot I speak in their language? Why cannot I open their eyes? Surely, they ought to know better. And when they find people do not listen to them, if they curse anybody, it should be themselves. But it is always the people's fault. They never try to make their sect large enough to embrace everyone. Therefore, we at once see why there has been so much narrow-mindedness. The part always claiming to be the whole. The little, finite unit always laying claim to the infinite. Think of little sects, born within a few hundred years out of fallible human brains, making this arrogant claim of knowledge of the whole of God's infinite truth. Think of the arrogance of it. If it shows anything, it is this, how vain human beings are. And it is no wonder that such claims have always failed, and by the mercy of the Lord are always destined to fail. In this line, the Mohammedans were the best off. Every step forward was made with the sword, the Quran in the one hand and the sword in the other. Take the Quran or you must die, there is no alternative. You know from history how phenomenal was their success. For 600 years, nothing could resist them. And then there came a time when they had to cry halt. So will it be with other religions if they follow the same methods. We are such babes. We always forget human nature. When we begin life, we think that our fate will be something extraordinary and nothing can make us disbelieve that. But when we grow old, we think differently. So with religions. In their early stages, when they spread a little, they get the idea that they can change the minds of the whole human race in a few years and go on killing and massacring to make converts by force. Then they fail and begin to understand better. We see that these sects did not succeed in what they started out to do which was a great blessing. Just think if one of those fanatical sects had succeeded all over the world, where would man be today? Now the Lord be blessed that they did not succeed. Yet, each one represents a great truth. Each religion represents a particular excellence, something which is its soul. There is an old story which comes to my mind. There were some ogresses who used to kill people and do all sorts of mischief, but they themselves could not be killed until someone found out that their souls were in certain birds, and so long as the birds were safe, nothing could destroy the ogresses. So each one of us has, as it were, such a bird, where our soul is, has an ideal, a mission to perform in life. Every human being is an embodiment of such an ideal, such a mission. Whatever else you may lose, so long as that ideal is not lost, and that mission is not hurt, nothing can kill you. Wealth may come and go. Misfortunes may pile mountains high, but if you have kept the ideal entire, nothing can kill you. You may have grown old, even a hundred years old, but if that mission is fresh and young in your heart, what can kill you? But when that ideal is lost and that mission is hurt, nothing can save you. All the wealth, all the power of the world will not save you. And what are nations but multiplied individuals? So each nation has a mission of its own to perform in this harmony of races. And so long as that nation keeps to that ideal, that nation nothing can kill. But if that nation gives up its mission in life and goes after something else, its life becomes short and it vanishes. And so with religions. The fact that all these old religions are living today proves that they must have kept that mission intact. 
in spite of all their mistakes in spite of all difficulties in spite of all quarrels in spite of all the incrustation of forms and figures the heart of every one of them is sound it is a throbbing beating living heart they have not lost any one of them the great mission they came for and it is splendid to study that mission take mohammedanism for instance christian people hate no religion in the world so much as mohammedanism they think it is the very worst form of religion that ever existed as soon as a man becomes a mohammedan the whole of islam receives him as a brother with open arms without making any distinction which no other religion does if one of your american indians becomes a mohammedan the sultan of turkey would have no objection to dine with him if he has brains no position is barred to him in this country i have never yet seen a church where the white man and the negro can kneel side by side to pray just think of that islam makes its followers all equal so that you see is the peculiar excellence of mohammedanism in many places in the quran you find very sensual ideas of life never mind what mohammedanism comes to preach to the world is this practical brotherhood of all belonging to their faith there is the essential part of the mohammedan religion and all the other ideas about heaven and of life etc are not mohammedanism they are accretions with the hindus you will find one national idea spirituality in no other religion in no other sacred books of the world will you find so much energy spent in defining the idea of god they try to define the idea of soul so that no earthly touch might mar it the spirit must be divine and spirit understood as spirit must not be made into a man the same idea of unity of the realization of god the omnipresent is preached throughout they think it is all nonsense to say that he lives in heaven and all that it is a mere human anthropomorphic idea all the heaven that ever existed is now and here one moment in infinite time is quite as good as any other moment if you believe in a god you can see him even now we think religion begins when you have realized something it is not believing in doctrines nor giving intellectual assent nor making declarations if there is a god have you seen him if you say no then what right have you to believe in him if you are in doubt whether there is a god why do you not struggle to see him why do you not renounce the world and spend the whole of your life for this one object renunciation and spirituality are the two great ideas of india and it is because india clings to these ideas that all her mistakes count for so little with the christians the central idea that has been preached by them is the same watch and pray for the kingdom of heaven is at hand which means purify your minds and be ready and that spirit never dies you recollect that the christians are even in the darkest days even in the most superstitious christian countries always trying to prepare themselves for the coming of the lord by trying to help others building hospitals and so on so long as the christians keep to that ideal their religion lives now an ideal represents itself to my mind it may be only a dream i do not know whether it will ever be realized in this world but sometimes it is better to dream a dream than die on hard facts great truths even in a dream are good better than bad facts so let us dream a dream you know that there are various grades of mind you may be a matter of fact common sense rationalist you do not care for forms and ceremonies you want intellectual hard ringing facts and they alone will satisfy you then there are the puritans the mohammedans who will not allow a picture or a statue in their place of worship very well but there is another man who is more artistic he wants a great deal of art beauty of lines and curves the colors flowers forms he wants candles lights and all the insignia and paraphernalia of ritual that he may see god his mind takes god in those forms as yours takes him through the intellect then there is the devotional man whose soul is crying for god he has no other idea but to worship god and to praise him then again there is the philosopher standing outside all these mocking at them he thinks what nonsense they are what ideas about god they may laugh at one another but each one has a place in this world all these various minds all these various types are necessary if there ever is going to be an ideal religion it must be broad and large enough to supply food for all these minds it must supply the strength of philosophy to the philosopher the devotee's heart to the worshipper 
To the ritualist, it will give all that the most marvelous symbolism can convey. To the poet, it will give as much of heart as he can take in, and other things besides. To make such a broad religion, we shall have to go back to the time when religions began and take them all in. Our watchword then will be acceptance and not exclusion. Not only toleration, for so-called toleration is often blasphemy, and I do not believe in it. I believe in acceptance. Why should I tolerate? Toleration means that I think that you are wrong and I am just allowing you to live. Is it not a blasphemy to think that you and I are allowing others to live? I accept all religions that were in the past and worship with them all. I worship God with every one of them, in whatever form they worship Him. I shall go to the mosque of the Mohammedan. I shall enter the Christian's church and kneel before the crucifix. I shall enter the Buddhistic temple where I shall take refuge in Buddha and in his law. I shall go into the forest and sit down in meditation with the Hindu, who is trying to see the light which enlightens the heart of everyone. Not only shall I do all these, but I shall keep my heart open for all that may come in the future. Is God's book finished? Or is it still a continuous revelation going on? It is a marvelous book. These spiritual revelations of the world, the Bible, the Vedas, the Quran, and all other sacred books are but so many pages, and an infinite number of pages remain yet to be unfolded. I would leave it open for all of them. We stand in the present, but open ourselves to the infinite future. We take in all that has been in the past, enjoy the light of the present, and open every window of the heart for all that will come in the future. Salutation to all the prophets of the past, to all the great ones of the present, and to all that are to come in the future.